topic for this period in the series, The Mind of Christ, is Modern Manipulators. Now, the definition of a manipulator, according to Webster, is one who attempts to manage or control artfully or by shrewd use of influence, especially in an unfair or fraudulent way for one's own purposes, heedless of the desires or good of the one manipulated. That's a manipulator. I've noticed this in my little granddaughter. One time she was doing some kind of minor mayhem on her little sister. I don't know what, probably pulling her hair or something. And her little sister said no. But just before her little sister said no... My daughter-in-law saw her at her nefarious activity and went over to her and uh, started going over toward her. And just about that time, my youngest granddaughter said no. And my oldest granddaughter right at that time saw mommy coming and she knew that that meant trouble. So... Just like that, she looked up at Mommy and said, Mommy, Melissa said no. (laughs) She wanted Mommy to turn her thoughts not on herself, but the only thing that was available was that very flimsy thing. How artfully... Even the young try to manipulate others against what is right. We start that very young. When I came up on the 31st of March by plane, I sat by a man who was reading the New York Times. When he was ready to get off the plane, he turned to me and said, Would you like to read the Times? And I said, Thank you, I'd be happy to. So I took his paper and... I was just working on, I'd been working on my section on mind manipulators on the way down when, while I was sitting there with him. So I was, it was fresh in my mind about mind manipulation when I picked up the Times. And, and there were three articles on the front page on manipulation. Notice this one. This one is the squeeze that retailers are trying to put on consumers and consumers are trying to resist the increase in prices and it has a large article on that. It's a front page article, maybe has oh, 10 or 15 column inches on this one uh, article and then it's continued on page 34, the third column, and there it has about as many more column inches on how the retailers are trying to manipulate and influence the retailers to buy their products even at higher prices. Then here is one that that is uh, of interest to several of you in the audience. This is Black Talk Radio. Black Talk Radio in Chicago. The at uh, in the early morning, it's a it's an AM radio WCEV. And it can barely be heard in the outreaches of Chicago during the day. But at night, it changes its call letters to WVON. And then from then until, I don't know, it's several hours, it has a specifically black-beamed radio talk show and manipulates people's minds. And the Times presents it just in that way. And the interesting thing is that it says that this uh, represents for the black community in Chicago a major voice. And in the, in the 
full part of the article. It tells about how the, the black radio is now taking the place of what was once occupied by the church. That's right. It takes the place of what once was occupied by the church. Very sobering thought, isn't it? That uh, in Chicago alone, one city, 80,000 listeners, which is, makes it the, the, one of the major radios in Chicago, radio voices in Chicago, it's manipulating the minds of 80,000 people. And here's another one. You wouldn't think of British people as, you know, they're sort of uninvolved and reserved, and you wouldn't think of them as being manipulators, but they are kings of the manipulators. <laughs> and they let their manipulation maintain a very low profile, but it's nevertheless extremely powerful. And here's one about the battle over Herod's and uh, the the way that uh, Roland, Ro- Roland, Roland, or Tiny Roland, a uh, maverick British businessman, is trying to take over Harrods and how he is trying to manipulate the British Parliament. That's, uh, that's the whole gist of the story. So I thought how, how widespread is manipulation. We need to understand what manipulation is. We need to understand that it is widespread, that it begins, er, that it is natural to human beings and that we begin early to doing it. No human being is up to the task of discerning unaided the difficulties that we face in modern life. And modern manipulators are everywhere. They're in the grocery stores, in the theaters, in the churches, on radio. They're everywhere we go. There are modern manipulators. The biggest place of manipulation is in the school rooms. In the, in the public schools, manipulation is done by the teachers, and it is by design. Teachers are taught how to manipulate children so that they will do what they wish them to, uh, sometimes even against the best good of the individual, but perhaps for the best good of the group. And uh, pa- uh, uh, teachers are taught how to do that. And we need to be aware of what is going on everywhere. We need to study the society that we live in so that we can protect ourselves and our children from the modern manipulators that we find today. Now, since this is a spiritually discerned matter, we want our training to be spiritual. Let's bow together and ask the Lord to assist us to understand this topic for today. Loving Father, With grateful hearts, we bow before Thee and recognize the great power that Your Spirit can have over the human mind to give us good judgment and proper perception. Help us to be yielded to Thy will in everything, to understand the powers and forces that wrestle against us, that try to influence our minds in such a way that we cannot receive your truth and that we cannot walk in your light and that we cannot study our children's characters and their personalities and those influences that come to bear on them so that we can protect them from the evil one. And so we pray that as we kneel here this morning, thy spirit will infuse us, will teach us how to be discerning, and will help us to avoid the inhibitions and deformities of our past hurts and our past sins. Help us not to feel hurt and deformed, 
because of the the blows and and the 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 poor deals that life may have dealt to us but help us to know that we really deserve nothing that the very worst that life could give to us is but what we deserve and help us to be thankful for any favors that we receive through thy grace and so as we attempt to develop maturity of mind guide us step by step that we might take no detours or make any missteps. This is our prayer, made earnestly in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Now, if you would take your Bibles and turn to the... First book of the Bible, to Genesis, and let's take a look at the third chapter. We have in this third chapter the masterpiece of manipulation on a personal basis. Masterpiece. There is nothing like it in all of history. We see the most intelligent woman who ever lived meeting one of the great supernatural masterminds of the universe, Lucifer. He he was created as nearly like the Creator as possible, as nearly like him as God could make him. That's how he was created. He is so masterful at the process of manipulation and deception that not a one of us has avoided being deceived by him. So powerful, so all-pervasive, so ever-present, is he? And so it it should not be surprising to us that he deceived and manipulated our first mother on earth, Eve, and influenced her so that she committed the first sin done by a human being. And then, very zealous as all people are who fall into sin, almost all people, zealous then to spread that virus. And she went to her husband and became his temptress. So let's just look at these these first several verses. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Eh, Eh. He got her attention. And with a little different tone than God spoke to her. And so her attention was immediately arrested. Eh, Has God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Question. A little question. A question not to ask for information, but a question to cast doubt in her mind, to arouse distrust. That tone of voice had in it that which brought distrust of God. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the the serpent said to the woman, Ye shall not surely die. What do you mean? Just a little bit of a belittling tone of voice then. First the distrust of the Creator. Now distrust of her own judgment, belittling her. She had never had that experience either. Two novel experiences. And he said, wham, wham. And she was startled. And he had destroyed her defenses in these two sharp blows. 
And it often happens to us in the same way. Wham! Wham! Two things hit us at one time. I am hungry, and there is the piece of pie. Two at one time. Wham! Wham! The evil without arouses evil within. Now, that's the way it is with us. It was not that way with Eve. She had no evil within. But he belittled her and said, You have been mistaken. Don't you see it? Or are you a little dull? See, all of that was put into that question, that statement. He shall not surely die. And he's been telling that that falsehood ever since, hasn't he? He shall not surely die. You're going to live forever. You may live in flames, but you're going to live forever. Everybody is immortal. You can't die. You won't. You surely won't die. Question. Do you feel she should not have answered him? Yes, I feel she should not have answered him. But we often are tricked into engaging in conversation when we should not have, when we should not engage. And often it comes like this, that it's a direct frontal attack, just like this, just like the serpent made to her. Just right, so there's hardly, you know, the natural human response is to make a reply. That's right. At at least to to defend one's position and uh, defend her trust defend herself. But she should have turned from him. And by the way, folks, that is what, that that is the proper use of will. When you recognize that something is not what it should be, then, or is something that will harm you, insofar as it is possible, your proper response is to turn from it and go away. The prudent man foreseeth evil and hideth himself. And that is what we should do. That is the proper use of will. It is not the proper use of will to see the tempting thing and it looks good. I'm not going to take it. What my friend of mine says, a white knuckles determination not to take it. We may have to do that if there is no possible way we can get away from it. Then it is white knuckles. But that's not the proper use of will if there is any other escape. The way that we should properly use the will is to use the will to remove yourself or to remove the tempting thing from you. And so the rest of this story is verse 5. Satan makes his coup d'etat for Eve. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that what the serpent had said was true, pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, was good for food, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And then she became the zealous destroyer of her husband, too. And those who go into uh, sin often become very zealous in promoting their sin. Those who go into adultery often become very zealous in uh, saying that adultery is not really sin. Anything that uh, has love about it... Love comes from God, and love is therefore not sin. Then, or uh, larceny is described as if I had not taken it, someone else would have. All manner of excuses to defend, or all and all manner of of um, uh, zealous attempts to get others to believe as one does about those things. Let us turn to the book of Isaiah, and we will find the position that we should take in this day, and that God's church will take in this day, will take as 
uh, those who are his representatives. The 58th chapter of Isaiah is that great missionary, medical missionary chapter in the Bible. Tells, these are our marching orders. The first several verses, uh, first verse says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression. He calls them his people. We may properly think of ourselves as his people in transgression. Then he tells about how they enter into all manner of religious activities. They fast, they pray, they go to church, they take the Lord's Supper, the ordinances. But in the day of their fast, they find their own pleasure. They do their own labor. They don't stop from labor and weep and pray before the Lord. But they debate and they enter into strife and they may fast merely because they are going to have an encounter with someone and they want to get the better of them or to manipulate them. But in verse 6, after he has told what people are doing to of a religious nature, then he says, Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke, every yoke, every manipulatory yoke that people might put on our necks. This is what God wants us to do. He wants us to be discerning But we cannot be discerning unless we have his Holy Spirit to guide us with the still, small voice behind the ear that says, This is the way. Walk ye in it. With our marching instructions, let's then do a little study from volume 8, page 212. We read this paragraph. Christian unity does not mean that the identity of one person is to be submerged in that of another, nor does it mean that the mind of one is to be led and controlled by the mind of another. God has not given to any man the power that some, by word or act, seek to claim. God requires man to stand free and to follow the directions of the word. Now, there are many examples that we have of uh, innocent, that we get into innocently, and sometimes we think that it is our duty to uh, be involved in this kind of, of uh, mind control. Husbands and wives often control one another in a manipulatory way. There was a book written not very long ago called Fascinating Womanhood that uh, told, t- taught women how to manipulate their husbands and was widely acclaimed among Seventh-day Adventists, even. Distributed widely and sold in in book and Bible houses all over. Christian bookstores everywhere carried it. Fascinating woman. It was written by a Mormon lady who um, just told everybody how how to handle their husbands. Um, Husbands handle wives, too, you know. The classic way of coming home with a bunch of roses and uh, honey, I bought a new car today. <laughs> and you know, in a lot of ways, husbands and wives manipulate each other. Yes. Okay. The question is asked about what about psychiatrists and psychiatry. Modern psychiatry is so influenced by Freudian influences, and I am just so diametrically opposed to almost most of what Freud stood for that it's just hard for me to accept modern psychiatry in any of its forms. And and much of psychiatry, the uh, counsel that they have given to people who have subsequently became become my patients, I have uh, I have just my hair would stand on end 
because of some of the counsel that was given. I just I cringe at even some of the terminology and words, the obscenity, the obscene pictures that were were painted by the psychiatrists for the uh, for the patients. And, uh, I, I understand that they are not all that way, and and that there are many many who really try to be Christian counselors, but generally speaking, the indirect method of counseling is used where the person is uh, encouraged to just bring up all the things that they have thought and bring those out into the open and review them and details are written down and the patient gets a very great anxiety that the doctor write down all the lurid details of the bizarre thoughts and experiences that they have had so it's all their own record so that any, any other person can come by and read that too and the patient gets a certain satisfaction out of knowing that these bizarre things that they have experienced are entertaining to somebody or, or at least of interest and uh, that people would want to, to read those and even talk about them. Um, our counsel is that we should not do that kind of thing, that anything that is bizarre or abnormal in the behavior of another person should be so much as possible forgotten and turned from and nothing made of it, and that we're not to have people review and review and review their, their bad experiences, that this kind of process uh, implants the material more deeply in the mind of the individual and makes it so that we can we uh, we have uh, uh, a, a problem in in healing the person but more on that a little bit later so I'd like for you to to hold uh, further questions on that until a little later <clears throat> let's talk a little bit more about how one person submerges their personality and individuality in another individual. I think we probably find it happening more that a woman submerges her personality in the personality of her husband than that the husband submerges his personality in the personality of his wife. But it can happen either way. But women are more naturally... Um, the clinging vine type and are more likely and and since men are generally more vivacious and active they are more likely to take the dominant role in a, a home and the one who is not dominant is very likely to become submerged in the personality of the other so that whatever my husband thinks and believes that's what I think too. Uh, he's, um, and I may never bring it out to the front, but my husband is a smart man. He's had lots of experience. He's older than I am. Um, he's, maybe he's more educated than I am. And therefore, whatever he believes certainly must be true. So I'll just accept it. I don't even have to think about it. And besides that, I, I may be required by God to believe just in that way. Whatever he says, I am probably supposed to believe, just like he says it. And a lot of women have that as a subconscious thing if it never actually comes out to the outside. But God does not require that women submerge their thoughts nor, nor fashion their attitudes because of what their husbands say. To the other, on the other side of this same coin is the reverse of that, that a woman thinks, well, let's see, now I'm supposed to be a strong mind. I am supposed to think for myself. And therefore, anything that he says, I'm going to be on the other side. That's wrong, too. <laughs> and sometimes that happens the other way, too. When the strong one is the woman... The husband may no, whatever she says, no, I don't, I don't believe that. It's not true. And may resist her opinions, which may be right, just because he is supposed to be the strong, dominant one in the family. And so he, he uh, says, no, I, I won't accept it. Either way, any, any attitude of that kind that we take is not right. Children 
and parents often have of an uncanny influence on one another. And I am amazed at how, especially sons, I think, on mothers, have a very almost magical influence. That whatever the son says, mother just believes that. And especially after he gets to be about 16 or 17, Whatever he says, whatever his opinions are about what happened, she just accepts that as that's the way it was. And it may or may not be the actual way that something was. He has a supernatural influence over his mother. But daughters may have the same over their mothers. Uh, Children may have the same kind of influence, or parents may have the same kind of influence over their adult children that uh, children will just accept what their parents say because they always have accepted what their parents say, but it may or may not be what they should accept. A manipulator is the cocktail party. This is probably the prototype of business manipulation. And people who go there go with the idea that they're, they're expecting that something is going to be brought up that they might be manipulated over. And they may decide ahead of time, I'm going to allow myself to be manipulated. I want to please this particular company who's putting on the cocktail party, and therefore, because I want to please them, because I'm expecting some favor, return favor out of them, I'll just allow myself to be manipulated. So that manipulators are everywhere today. Labor unions are big manipulators of our day. We should have nothing to do with labor unions. They are areas where we may break the yokes and undo the heavy burdens, loose them, so that uh, people are not um, bound by any kind of burden. Not only is it unfair for employers to pressure their employees, it is, not un, it is not fair for employees to pressure their employers. Neither way is fair. It is both sinful, and we should not have to do with any one of those. No matter what the past may have been, and the past has been a dreadful thing, it, has, it is quite true that, that uh, workers and, and laborers have been uh, ill-treated in the past, dreadfully ill-treated, even to the point of their dying of starvation while working diligently for their, for their employers. No matter what the past has been, it does not justify a present in which the employer exerts a manipulatory pressuring effect on the employer, the employee on the employer. Now there is another very subtle form of labeling This one begins also in childhood. You may be called a liberal or a conservative or a reformer or fatso or any one of a hundred names, a fundamentalist, a a neurotic, a plodder. A child may be called pretty, another form of manipulation. All manipulation is not negative in its, in its aspects, but some manipulation is very uh, pleasing, like, what a pretty little girl, how talented you are. Uh, we need to be extremely careful of our children and our grandchildren, that we do not allow them to be flattered. And if, they, if the flattery continues, the, the adult who is doing it should simply be called down. Just, uh, it isn't good for my child or my grandchild to hear flattery. So please refrain from doing it and say that with enough, uh, uh, positiveness that it is, it is not repeated. Let us turn to Ephesians and we will see that only safe place that we can put our full trust. Ephesians 2, and we'll begin with verse 6.
we'll see here that we are united with Christ. With his mind alone can we be safe. We can have all confidence in him. And he alone will not be changed or altered by our following him. And that is not true with human beings. If we follow any human being, they will be altered by the very fact that we have submerged our personalities in theirs. Ephesians 2, beginning with verse 6, And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together, or be united, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. It is with Christ that we may be thoroughly, fully, and totally united. And if under any circumstances we unite ourselves to follow, to be overly influenced by some other person, it it is wrong for us to do that. Now I'd like to show you something that represents in human experience one of the most important of our mind influences, that of the influence of the hypnotist over the person who is hypnotized. You are probably aware that Eve was hypnotized in the garden. That was how she uh, was led to accept what the tempter had to say. And I'll go with, go into with you the process of hypnotism so that you will know how it, how it is done. No individual should be permitted to take control of another person's mind, thinking that in so doing he is causing him to receive great benefit. This mind cure is one of the most dangerous deceptions which can be practiced upon any individual. Temporary relief may be felt, but the mind of the one thus controlled is never again so strong and reliable. Never again. So hypnosis is not a proper form of therapy. Hypnosis injures the mind. It makes the mind slip into a pattern of allowing itself to be deceived more easily. This is one of the most serious things in modern life because probably each one of us has been hypnotized not once nor twice, but many, many times. Yes, that's from Second Selected Messages 449 and 50. From Medical Ministry 110 and 111, cut away from yourselves everything that savors of hypnotism, the science by which satanic agencies work. When I was in medical school, it was quite the thing to do hypnosis, and I learned how to do it from the world's foremost clinical hypnotist, Dr. Thigpen. Maybe some of you have heard of him. If you haven't heard of him, you've probably heard of a novel that was written about one of our patients. The Three Faces of Eve. Have you ever heard of that? Well, that was Fig Pen's patient, and I saw her several times when I was in medical school. Her, I can't remember her real name. I believe it may have been Valerie. And Valerie was um, a very demure proper young lady, but she had uh, had an unusual attachment to Dr. Thigpen, and he was a strong, forceful sort of personality. Not that all people who hypnotize have to be strong and forceful, but many are. 
And when she came, the, I remember the first time I saw her. When she came into the room, she came in and sat down, and there was a table here. And Big Ben was down on the other end, and she sat down here, and and I was over there. And uh, Big Ben began to talk with her, and pretty soon he he put her in a trance, and immediately she became another person. That was back in the days when women often wore hats when they went downtown, hats and heels and hose. That was the proper way to dress when you went downtown. She took off the hat, threw it down on the table and sort of slid it like that and had a jaunty attitude and, and uh, crossed her legs and, and uh, made certain that in the process her pretty knees got uh, shown very nicely and then she began to sit there and, and uh, shake her leg like this and, and uh, just just as jaunty as she could be. And pretty soon she jumped up and went over to the window and looked out. And totally different personality. As different as night and day. And then it, at, at the time that I was uh, there in medical school, she only had two personalities, but she later developed, he later discovered three. And it was at that point that the novel was written. But before she, he was finished with her, she had a bunch of personalities. She may have had 20 or 30. And they all had different names, and she named them. And uh, um, became she became very dependent on him. She could dial his number, and, and when he picked up the phone, she would go into a trance. Was so His influence over her was so great. Hypnosis is based on the power of suggestion so that the subconscious mind of one person will accept orders from the conscious mind of another individual. The conscious mind of the receptor ceases to function as the directive agent. Rather, the hypnotist's conscious mind is in control and the person hypnotized accepts the suggestions of the hypnotist. It is not sleep, not at all. It is incorrectly called hypnosis, which means sleep. Hypnosis has been described as a sleep-like trance. Now, the conditions for hypnosis. The subject must be willing, intelligent, and cooperative. You cannot be hypnotized against your will. The hypnotist must be thoroughly confident and capable. We have both a conscious level at which we work and a subconscious level. Right now, you are all working at both of those levels, the conscious and the subconscious, so that there are influences on you that are subconscious. There are influences that can be that that uh, a speaker can have on an audience. Um, there are things that I can do that will make you stay awake better. <laughs> or there are things that I can do that will make you calm down. If, if I uh, um, see that you're becoming too excited about what I say, there is a way to sort of calm people down by the way that, that you talk to them, the, what the speaker says or how, they, how the speaker goes about that often works at a subconscious level. It is subtle things that are seen and heard, uh, such as a quick motion like that. And if, uh, if an audience starts to go to sleep, I will try to make quick motions. <laughs> uh, one of our teachers here at Uchi Pines one time used to do this kind of thing if people started going to sleep. He'd start walking like this, and he'd emphasize his points by a little clap of the hands. And that would sort of wake people up a little bit. Many of these things work at the subconscious level. But notice this. And here is a big point. Here is how TV hypnotizes you. And I would like to tell you that this is just how I was taught to hypnotize people by Dr. Thigpen. A darkened room, 
sound blanked out pretty much. It didn't have to be silent. We could do it in, in this room. Even the noises outside that you can easily hear with the birds and the uh, tractor on the farm and uh, sometimes a car going by, those won't interfere too much. But not a lot of noise in the room. Then the, a position of least awareness of your own body. Make the person comfortable. Get in your easy chair and lean back. And My parents used to have one of these reclining chairs. Each one of them had one. It just... They had just the kind that just fit them and just would get in front of the TV and and, uh, just become hypnotized (laughs) right in front of the TV. A lot of people have their own recliner, one that just suits them, put it right in front of the TV so that they can, their own body and any discomfort that they might have, don't even have to hold the head up and even rest the head back and, and watch the television. Then the internal organs idle. It isn't best for the person to be in a, in a condition of, of uh, active digestion or uh, having a full bladder or being uh, excessively tired. Any of those things can interfere with hypnotism. Thinking dims and you just instruct the person Believe You just listen to my voice and just think about what I tell you to think about. That's the way the, the hypnotist begins to have the influence over the other person. The eyes move less than any other experience of life, even sleeping and dreaming. This is unconscious staring. And so the, the hypnotist puts something for the person to see often. The hypnotist may hold something and say, look at this, and he, and he may move it slightly so that the person can more easily keep the eyes focused right on that. But if it is moved, it is usually moved only slightly, just like the TV screen. You don't have to move your eyes hardly at all with a TV. You just go right, put the eyes right there. They hardly move. At all. You never even move them from one part of the screen to the other. Just focus on one part. Sometimes the hypnotist will have the person just stare at the ceiling. TV is really sensory deprivation. And that's what you try to do in hypnotism. Try to make it so that they're not hearing, not seeing, not smelling, not tasting, not even thinking about anything except what you tell them to. That's hypnotism. And I believe that TV does hypnotize people and that while they are in that position, they are quite capable of receiving what is called a post-hypnotic suggestion. One time when we were with Eve, Thigpen took a big rubber band from his pocket, which he had brought just for the purpose. He pulled it out and he said, now... uh, whatever her name was in that personality, while she was in a trance, he said, I'm going to do something to your arm, but it is not going to hurt you. I'm going to just touch you right here on the, on the arm, but it is not going to hurt. And when you come out of the trance, you will not remember what happened. So he took the rubber band and he did like that and popped her on the arm with, the, with it stretched as tight as it could. And in, rather shortly, within a minute, it had made a wheel with a large red uh, zone around it. And she held her arm there, did not flinch the slightest with that pain. When he brought her out of the trance, and she became Valerie again, He said, Valerie, what what did you do to your arm there? She said, oh, I don't know. I don't know what it was. She sort of rubbed it like that. He said, does it hurt? She said, no, it doesn't hurt. But there was a big wheel there and a big red zone around it. Post-hypnotic suggestion, she could not remember that. 
And during the trance, the suggestion that she would feel no pain, and she felt no pain. We have that same kind of thing to happen to us with TV. And uh, with TV, we can be given post-hypnotic suggestions. Not just that this cereal is better than that cereal. That's serious enough. But this attitude toward morality is better than what you have had. This is what everybody is doing these days. And homosexuality is no sin. It is just another alternative lifestyle. To go to bed with someone's husband other than your own is ordinary and commonplace. It is no sin, not in our day. It used to be when people thought it was bad. But today, it's altogether different. And the psychologists tell us that for a person who has strong morals, that it takes from 35 to 60 exposures before their morals begin to change or begin to soften in the area that they had once been firm on. Now, since in any prime time TV, there are seven adulterous um, exposures per hour, you can see that it wouldn't take but about seven hours of TV viewing during prime time for you to begin to change your moral values and to become a bit confused on the subject of what morality really is in certain areas, what honesty really is, what what theft really is. Is it really all right for me to um, take my employer's goods or to use his equipment for my own use without even asking. All of those kinds of things are taught on TV. It is the greatest mind manipulator of all time. And the greatest thing, the most wonderful thing that we ever did in our family, I think, was that day when we, when our television broke down and we never got it repaired. I recommend that for all of you. And no matter how big and beautiful it is, we had a big and beautiful color TV set in times when not everybody had a color TV. And it broke down uh, with a little help from Mother. And <laughs> my housekeeper asked if when it wasn't working for several weeks and there was no plan to get it repaired. She asked if, uh, if she could have it, and I said, you certainly may. In fact, I will have my truck to take it over to your house. And it was delivered to her home, and uh, we have never had a TV in the house since then, except to, uh, on, on occasion to play a videotape of some kind when we might bring in a TV set. And I recommend that for all of you. I am against television. Now, let me qualify that just a little bit. That does not mean that it is a sin to look at TV. It may or may not be a sin. It depends on who you are, what you're viewing, and what the circumstances are. But let me just say this word about news on TV. I have spent a good bit of time in TV studios And I know a little bit about how they make the news. And it is indeed manufactured, much of the news is manufactured in the, in the TV studios. From a bit incident, or maybe it's something that's big that's played down. At any rate, the news itself is really manufactured in the studio itself. And it is dealt with in the way that those who report the news want people to think about that event. Let us take the book. Uh, yes. How? What about the newspapers? W- were you here when I brought out the New York Times? <laughs> A little earlier, I brought out the New York Times, and 
went into that. You might like to just take a look at uh, the New York Times for March 31st and just see the just the front page articles that show the manipulatory devices of uh, people who are in positions of authority and influence in our world today. Yes, I uh, don't have any use for video games. <laughs> Scientifically, they've already proven that some games consistently played cause MS. Oh. Now that was on the Cause news. MS. Yeah, well, it was uh-huh. on like, like 2020. Or... Uh-huh. I had not heard that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Cause, the, the cause the MS, disease. multiple sclerosis. They, uh, they'll sit and watch it for two and three hours at a time to see Yes. 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 Well, there's also a, a modern disease called Pac-Man's finger. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah, we did get rid of our TV, and I was fine, and we brought it back in just only to watch the three inches broadcasting network. Mm-hmm. And I've fallen quite a few times changing the stations back and forth, and I think that's why the Lord led me down here. Uh huh. <laughs> yes. Excuse me just a moment. I'll do that. Thank you. Question. Uh-huh. Going back to something you were talking about earlier with little children about praising them. Yes, flattery of children. Mm-hmm. I was wondering about when they when they uh, do something good, like my little grandson. We've been trying to teach him to pray, mm-hmm. and you know we'll say you need to be for you to be good job, something like that. It's All right. The question is, if a child does something that is good behavior and you reinforce it by commenting on the fact that they did something good, is that damaging to the child? And the answer is no. That is appreciation for what is good. And uh, that's how the child learns. Let me show you how it works. By appreciation of what is good and by disapproval of what is not good. Now, I said both of those in a very mild voice because that's how I'd like you to receive that. The appreciation should not be so flowery and exuberant as to make the child uh, believe that he has been flattered. But it's just, uh, son, that was good. I'm very pleased that you did that. And I I do the same thing with my my grandchildren. Um, Melissa, that was very nice. Grandmother is pleased that you gave up that toy so that Christina could play with it for a while. And, And that's a reinforcement of that. And it is quite proper to do that. Then when they do something that you don't like, it is not to scream and yell at them and switch them and so forth for doing something that is wrong. But but very often, all that is needed for a child is a very quiet, that isn't the way that that, uh, it should be done. This particular thing should be done another way. Or it it was not good for you to do that. Next time, do it this way and tell them how to do it another way. And often that will be that will bring about far better response than uh, any kind of uh, punishment or scolding or belittling or this kind of thing for doing something that is wrong. Most children will learn to desire to please their parents. If their parents deal with them with a gentle hand, they always touch them gently. And they treat them with respect, not belittling, uh, not scolding, uh, not nagging. 
and not remembering uh, their past ills. And children are like this. A child can can just do something that just annoys you to the point that you're just just nearly ready to cry. And and you or maybe they hurt your feelings so that you know that you will never get over this. It'll take you a month to get over this. And within three minutes they don't even remember it. And you shouldn't either. You should make of it uh at that moment you should make the correction and and uh uh, tell the child that they did something that uh, wasn't good, and then forget it. Then if they do that same thing again, you go through exactly the same thing again. With a gentle hand and a low tone of voice, you take them aside and you speak to them gently. Loud tones, scolding voices should never be heard by children from their parents because they, for for them, you represent God. And you are teaching them who God is by how you deal with them. And if you deal with them in an immature, uh, plaintive, accusatory way, that's how they're going to visualize God. Now, would you take your little booklets, Principles of Mental Development, <coughs> and... Let us turn to page 11. The Faculty of Faith. Does everyone have a book? All right. Um, If you have one and didn't bring it with you and you want to borrow another, feel free to do so. Then you may turn it in. Would you mind? uh, Everybody who doesn't have one, you'll need one to look on. Then you can just... uh, Give it back to me after it's over. Page 11. The Faculty of Faith. Faith dwells in the part of the brain that also gives us the function of imagination. Okay? The imagination is the organ that has the function of faith. Most of us have a sick imagination. How did we get a sick imagination? By novels that we have read? Novels sicken, weaken the imagination by uh, fears that we have allowed to come into our imaginations. We weaken the imagination by, uh, uh, by dwelling on things that have injured us in some way, any way, whether it be something that was embarrassing or something that was... Uh, that, uh, was fearful. We can injure the imagination by allowing the mind to dwell on that thing. You remember the other day when I showed you the diagram of the gray matter of the brain and the circular pattern of thoughts, but the uh, vertical pattern of the uh, muscular activity in the brain. If you have something that the mind dwells on and you cannot shake it, do muscular activity, lots of it, heavy activity, as heavy as you can, and out of doors, and look at the things that God has provided for us that we might have that would take our attention off ourselves and our problems and put it on one of those wonderful things that God has made for us. For this reason, children should be taught from their earliest days to be out of doors, watching, looking at nature, uh, seeing the birds and trees and rocks and grass, and, and having some wise adult tell them what these things mean. 
so that their attention can be drawn to those things. When they are adults and they need to have the attention drawn from something that the mind is dwelling on, they will more readily be able to grasp those things and let the mind be attracted to things that they know a lot about. If they know what violets are called, then they are not just a blue blur on the uh, hillside, but they become friends. And they can go up and speak to a violet and say, this is a, um, this is a bird's foot violet. Or this is a pansy violet. And by letting the attention go on to that, they can uh, keep the mind from dwelling on something that would injure the imagination. Foods will injure the imagination also. Foods can, that to which the brain is sensitive, just as the nose is sensitive to certain foods and can give you hay fever if you eat those, And the blood vessels can react to certain foods and give you a migraine if you eat them. So can certain foods make the mind have some bizarre thoughts. I had a patient one time who came to me because she had bizarre thoughts. I've had several patients like that who had bizarre thoughts. This young lady told me that one time she went down to the bank she was the banker in the family. She had the uh, month, monthly statement. She needed to make a deposit. And when she got inside, her mind began, began to say, what if I had come here to rob this bank? I know I didn't, but what if I had? Oh, how terrible it would have been if I had come here to rob this bank. And she began to magnify that in the imagination and it became such a horror to her that she had to run from the bank, literally run from the bank before she got her banking done and got in her car and and drove away without doing the banking. I had another patient who had small children and she would do the very same thing. What if? I were to put one of my children in the washing machine. I know I would never do it, but what if I should do it? What what a dreadful thing that would be if I were to do that kind of thing. And therefore, I must be a terrible person. And because I have these thoughts, I must be insane. And she would call her husband and his talking to her her talking to him in that way would not reassure him that she was not insane and so when a doctor when she became so uncomfortable with it that she went to see a doctor and he suggested that it might be good if she saw a psychiatrist they were both quite ready to accept that kind of suggestion and she didn't need that at all when we put her on a good diet It wasn't long before she stopped having that kind of bizarre thought. So I uh, recommend to you, if you have a diseased imagination, that you look at it from several different standpoints, not just the standpoint of uh, the fact that you think you might not be all, uh, you might might be maybe a little insane in some area. Question. Was she a Christian? Yes, she was a Christian. Yes, so she was an she was an active Methodist and and uh, went uh, never missed never missed it. She'd grown up in a very uh, active uh, Sunday school type of setting. From Hebrews eleven six, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Skip down several paragraphs to Proverbs 2, 6. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. From God, the fountain of wisdom, proceeds all the knowledge that is of value to man. Do you believe that? All the knowledge that is of value to man? Do you think it all comes from God? Well, good. I'm glad you do. Because it all does. 
There isn't any knowledge that was generated by man. All that the intellect can grasp or retain, the true knowledge comes not from infidels or wicked men. The word of God is light and truth. The true light shines from Jesus Christ, who lighteth every man that cometh into the world. From the Holy Spirit proceeds divine knowledge. He knows what humanity needs to promote peace, happiness, and restfulness here in this world and to secure eternal rest in the kingdom of God. Whose ambition, who here has an ambition higher than that? Who wants more than peace, happiness, restfulness here in this world, and and eternal rest in the world hereafter? Is there anybody here whose ambition is higher than that? Do you see then that if we wish to have knowledge, happiness, peace, and rest, where do we go primarily to get it? To the Bible, to God's Word. We study that and it teaches us the grand concepts of all time. Only in this way can we get it. Only in this way. There are only a few technical things that we need to learn from each other. All true knowledge comes from God, and everything technical is based on laws which God established. But we can learn more about how to do technical things. We can become better at technical things if we have first had a a study of God's Word. The last paragraph on that page, page 11, faith that enables us to receive God's gifts is itself a gift of which some measure is imparted to every human being. It grows as exercised in appropriating the word of God. In order to strengthen faith, we must often bring it in contact with what? The word of God. That's how we strengthen faith. All right, page 12. Second paragraph, faith is the gift of God, but the power to exercise it is ours. Faith is the hand by which the soul takes hold upon the divine offer of grace and mercy. Right in the middle of the page, to abide in faith is to put aside feeling and selfish desires, to walk humbly with the Lord to appreciate his promises and to apply them to all occasions, believing that God will work out his own plans and purposes in your heart and life by the sanctification of your character. It is to rely entirely, to trust implicitly upon the faithfulness of God. If this course is followed, others will see the special fruits of the Spirit manifested in the life and character. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette or reel-to-reel in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International Copyright, American Christian Ministries. All rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 800-233-4450. International calls dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministries.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony. We'll share it with our speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He's coming soon.